Pico 8 is a fantasy console, it never existed as hardware. But in the Pico 8 community there is this dream, right? There is this dream to turn that fantasy into reality. Recently I've been sent one of those devices and it made me wonder, is the search for the ideal Pico 8 handheld maybe over? Hi, I'm Christian from Lazy Devs, and today we are talking handhelds. So there have been a lot of experiments with various open source handhelds in the Pico 8 community, but so far a lot of the devices had some caveats, right? You had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get it to work, and even if you did, the results were not ideal. So for example, some time ago I reviewed the game shell, and my takeaways were that it had a bad screen, and it was a bit too finicky to set up, and it was too expensive. But I also realized that at the end of the day, you know, playing Pico 8 on a handheld like this was pretty awesome and it was probably worth the trade-off for some of us. And I also speculated that there is room, right? There is room for another device to come in and improve all those problems. Well, guess what? It's the future now <laughs> and things have changed. Now I live in China and actually I do have uh, access, easy access to a bunch of those Chinese retro handhelds. And you know, there's like dozen models coming out every year. I have been playing around with some of them and I was looking for one to recommend to you guys. So here's one that I think might be interesting if you are into Pico 8. It's called the Qi Game Force and I thought I'm gonna give it a short review. Quick disclaimer, this has been sent to me by the manufacturer. Uh, I have not received any monetary compensation for the video and the manufacturer did not have any editorial control over this video. In fact, they haven't seen it before I released it here on YouTube. All right, so the Qi Game Force. The unboxing is nothing to write home about. It arrives in a plain cardboard box. It's actually shipped with and already inside its own carrying case. You also get a short manual, a microfiber cloth, and a cheap USB-C cable for charging. So let's talk first impressions. <coughs> um, well, if you're not gonna say anything, then I'm gonna have to say it. This thing is ugly. Oh my gosh, it's so ugly. It, ah, the colors, the design, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, okay, so the colors, right? Uh, the one I have here is kind of like a 90s toxic green that is so vibrant, it's almost like, it almost hurts to look at, you know? And the other one I unboxed earlier was a similar crazy orange. And there's also a third one that's even more insane. That's kind of like, it looks like spoiled milk. And we're gonna talk about that later. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, no, it's... Oof, who came up with these colors? Okay, the actual device is all plastic, which I typically prefer, actually. Uh, but it, the plastic does not feel nice. It has a bit of a styrofoamy, thin, flimsy feel to it. It reminds me of like McDonald's Happy Meal toys and pest dispensers. I don't really think that it would break or anything. It, like, it's, it's sturdy, all right. But it just feels a little bit like a cheap toy for kids, right? The design is all over the place. On top we have like this straight boxy look. At the bottom there is like this huge chin with sweeping curves. Uh, and on the back, like what's happening on the back here? You have like these insane horns at the shoulder buttons, rounded bulges at the sides and a perfectly flat space here that like, just like looks like they gave up there. It's like it's unfinished. What's happening here? It feels like it was designed by five people where everybody got to design one side of it. It's really like, you know, like the Pontiac Aztec of retro handhelds, oof. Except check this out, you know, this is the Pontiac Aztec by the way of Fast and Furious, right? So one defining feature of the Game Force is that it has an RGB LED backlighting on all of the buttons. So you can light it up like a Christmas tree and it, you can even like change the colors. It's, hmm, yeah, hmm. It's certainly a look that is popular here in China, I can tell you that. And yeah, it just makes it even more feel like something that is made for kids. And it doesn't hold up in the details either. There's a bunch of superfluous text on a screen bezel, the reminiscent of the game shell, I guess, maybe? Except, you know, the English here is very, very iffy and they have the logo on here twice for some reason, except it's different. <sighs> mm. I hate the analog sticks. They feel thin and flimsy. They don't click when you press them. You just, you just can't press them. The rubber cap on top is super cheap. You can even see blisters from the injection molding on the sides, like, mm, yikes! And when you turn it on, it's actually a dead brick. You have to visit some websites to download an image file and flash that onto an SD card, and it doesn't even come with the SD card. Yikes! And the slot for the SD card is actually not well cut, so if you have butterfingers, your SD card might fall into the device. Yikes! And then 
well, okay, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, so, uh, but this is like a typical scenario that I go through, not just this device, but actually other Chinese devices as well. You finally get it to work, you launch into a game, and the music starts blaring loudly, and you realize that you don't know how to change the volume. So you panic and you start looking for the volume buttons. Guess what? There are no volume buttons, there is no dials nor anything. So you start pressing all of the buttons to maybe see if some of the buttons does something. Is it button one? Nope. Is it button two? Nope. All right, so now we're really panicking. Let's get back to the home menu. The home button surely does the trick, right? Nope, that doesn't do anything either. So you press the power button and that actually puts the device into sleep mode. And that solves the problem, but only temporarily, because if you press it again, you will just be back where you were. So the only thing that you can actually do at this point is just to long press the power button to force a shutdown and hope that this doesn't corrupt the SD card. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Did I mention that this device is $100? This device is $100. It's not necessarily expensive, but it's more expensive than this looks. And after this kind of first impression, I would start to have doubts if this was a sound investment. But first impressions can be deceiving, and after a lot of playtesting, I'm here to tell you that, that I like this thing. Yeah, I like it, it's good. Here, let me explain. Let's give it a second look. Let's go back to the beginning. Oh, whoa, 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 okay, that's a little bit too far back. But actually, while we're here, I want to say that I like the case, I think that's a good idea. Uh, it seems stupid, but this is actually the first accessory that you end up buying anyway. Like, once you like a device, once you want to use it, you want to take it with you, and you just don't want to toss it in your bag. You want to put it in some kind of protective thing. And uh, finding one that fits your device perfectly can be difficult if it's an exotic device like this one, right? So I like that they shipped this thing with a case that was made for this. And this was actually made for this, right? You can tell that this was, you know, specifically molded for this device. You can see by the bumps on the backside. And I also like how it doubles as padding for shipping, so they can get away with less packaging. This is good, this is well thought out. All right, so let's talk about the colors and the LEDs. As I said, there are dozens of devices like this coming out every year, and they all look similar, and they actually have almost similar specs as well. So you can say what you want about the game first, but it certainly looks distinct in a sea of black rectangles. If you're like me, you will just turn off the LEDs and they will never bother you. And look, like the milk one actually looks not bad. The photos on the website made it look like really janky, but after seeing all three colors, this is actually my favorite. The off-white color kind of reminds me of, you know, old computers, old beige computers. And it's kind of, um, there's like a nice contrast here between the black buttons and the black bezel and, you know, the rest of the device. That's a look I can get used to. The sticks are a bit of a mystery to me. The manufacturer says they were made by the company ALPS, which is the same company that does the Vita sticks. And now that I think about it, yeah, that kind of tracks. The Vita sticks also felt a bit flimsy. And also they didn't click in, like this one. But if you do like a direct comparison, this still uh, feels different than the Vita sticks. Like the Game 4 sticks have more travel. And the, that rubber cap, as I talk about, it's still rubbish. It's, it's not the same as the Vita sticks. It's horrible. But let's not get hung up with the sticks too much, because I think in the end they might not matter all that much. We're going to talk about performance later, but this device will be playing mainly 8-bit and 16-bit consoles, and obviously the Pico 8. So there's a good chance that you never will be actually using the sticks anyway. So instead, let's talk about the buttons. I like these buttons! So first a quick overview. There's like two different technical solutions to make buttons work on a console. There is um, the old solution, the old school solutions, which are rubber domes, rubber dome buttons. Um, they make the buttons uh, have more travel and they make the buttons feel more mushy. And mushy is a bad word, we have a word with a bad connotation these days, but it's actually not in this case. It's actually a feel that a lot of players might prefer. So that, that's the first solution, the rubber domes. And the second solution, uh, I guess the more modern ones, especially for, for portable consoles, are micro switches. And so the Nintendo Switch uses micro switches for all of their buttons, and those buttons will then have very little travel, they will move very little, and they will feel clicky when you press them. So the Game Force uses rubber domes for all of the front-facing buttons and micro switches for the shoulder buttons and the home button. The D-pad in particular turned out really well, I think. It has a large, flat, smooth design, which I think is really nice if you want to hit those diagonals. And despite it being a rubber dome, it's actually pretty firm. Uh, meaning it doesn't really slide around too much. Uh, it has just the right amount of travel, and when you press it, it will depress all the way down, almost until it's flush with the case. It sticks out a little bit, 
to me this is as good as it gets. The buttons on the right feel a bit different. They depress almost all the way down as well, but they stick out a lot more, so they have a lot more travel. And they have also quite a bit of play, so if I wedge my finger in between I can move them around. They have a distinct button mashy feel to them. It's a bit more than I'm used to, but not in a way that I would necessarily mark as negative. I'm kind of into it now, actually. Although I have to admit, there is one situation where the looseness gets in the way, and I wanted to address this because other reviewers also talked about it, and I wanted to add my own take on this. So the problem happens when you have to press two buttons at the same time in certain games. So for example, when you play Super Mario on the NES, and what you typically do there is you keep your thumb on the B button, you keep the B button pressed to run, right? And then when you want to jump, you kind of pivot your, your thumb so it also presses the A button, so you kind of press both buttons at the same time that way. This still works on the game force, it's not like it's not possible, but because the buttons are so loose and, and the travel is so big, um, it can feel a bit awkward. Like you may end up, when you pivot your thumb, you may end up just tilting the A button without actually pressing it, or um, the button will press, but it will scrape along the housing while you press it so it won't feel as smooth. You kind of have to settle into a technique that works for you. But I also think this is a particularly awkward game to play on a four button controller like this. I had similar issues with other devices in the past and it's just like an awkward diagonal to press two buttons at the same time on. And so when I play Super Mario World on a Game Force I have no problem at all, even though that's kind of like a similar input that I'm pulling off. I'm also holding one button and then pressing another button to jump. But this time, you know, running is the Y button and jumping is the B button. And that's a, just a way more comfortable di diagonal that kind of like matches, you know, the way your thumb presses on the buttons. So yeah, this is an issue, but I don't think it's necessarily a deal breaker. You kind of can get used to it. I kind of did get used to it. And if it really bothers you, then you can address it by just changing the button configuration for certain consoles like the NES or the Game Boy. With that out of the way, the shoulder buttons have a completely different feel since they are using micro switches. So they are clicky and there's very little travel, they're very they're not moving at all, they're very solid. I heard one reviewer complain that they are too sensitive or something, or that it's difficult to feel them trigger or something. I don't know what the problem is. They they're fine, they're just fine, they just feel exactly the way the bumpers feel on the switch. They're they're perfectly fine to me. Overall, the buttons feel great to me, and actually in my tests against other consoles, and we're gonna talk about comparisons to other consoles later, um, the buttons were actually the reasons why I came back to the Game Force. They just really feels really nice. Generally, the entire console sits well in my hands. Those weird horns in the back, you know? Uh, I actually ask what they are. They are supposed to be ergonomic rests, so you have um, a place to put your fingers without touching the shoulder buttons. I'm not really sure if that helps, but this is a comfortable handheld for me. This is a big deal. Just to round up the tour, the micro SD card slot and the power button sit at the top of the device. I like the placement, there is no danger of accidentally turning off the console or anything. At the bottom of the device you'll have a headphone jack. Hi Apple. The USB-C socket for charging. Also hi Apple. And a tiny hole that will reset the device. I think that's a reset button. So let's talk about uh, how this device comes without any software or SD card. It's counterintuitive, but I think this is actually good. So when I buy those devices, they do come often with firmware, but that firmware is hopelessly outdated and it's set to Chinese and it has a bunch of Chinese ROMs. And all of that is flashed to like the cheapest possible garbage SD card that will immediately die on me. So I'm kind of like used to the fact that I you know, I have to flash my own system, my own, uh, you know, most recent firmware on a good SD card that I know will work. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like a procedure that I have to go every time I buy those devices. And so when I do get them, I actually try to get a device that uh, comes with no SD card or where the SD card that it comes with is, you know, the smallest possible so you don't have to pay extra, right? And also you have to keep in mind that these devices run on open source software, so the manufacturers actually might not be allowed to sell the software, right? So the GameForce runs on a software called EmuElec, and when you boot it up, it actually straight out says, like, this is free software and it shouldn't be sold. So not bundling the software with the device may be actually the ethical way to go in this case. And the manufacturer of the Game Force makes it actually super user-friendly, uh, so the website is listed clearly in manual and actually on the device itself. So you just go there, download the image file, download a small tool, and flash it on the SD card. And once you're finished, you pop that SD card in the game shell. And that, when it gets really good. 
A bunch of scripts will come to life and they will you know, set up the entire system for you. They will resize the partitions they, you know, so they match the size of the SD card and they will drop you off into something that is called the emulation station. That's the front end of the device. And boy, is this a nice place to be. If you saw my game shell review, you might remember how I complained about the software, how it looked you know, all flashy and fancy, but it's actually, it was bare bones and unfinished underneath. This is a completely different story. Emulation Station has been in development for a couple of years now. It's been designed for media computers that are hooked up to a TV. The idea is to provide a nice polished UI that unifies different emulators into one sleek, controller-friendly experience. It's just wonderful. You can browse you all your ROMs in an interface reminiscent of Netflix. You can even download automatically you know, all the box art, the screenshots and the demo videos for all your ROMs on the device itself. You can download and install new themes. There are tons of settings to tweak and customize, but honestly, even the defaults work just fine. And the integration with the GameForce is pretty sweet. The GameForce is fully supported by the Emulec firmware. You can even control the color of the LEDs directly from within Emulation Station. I, I will never do that, but I know that I could. Remember that home button that did nothing? Well, here's the deal. It's actually not a home button. It should have been labeled differently, like shift or control or function or something, because pressing this and holding this button and then pressing other buttons will trigger various function in the software. And this is awkward, but they actually list all of the combinations in the manual. So yeah, hmm. Reading the manual, huh? Uh, what a concept. It's kind of similar to the game shell, except this time it actually works, yes. So yeah, you can actually change the volume by holding the home button and pressing the D-pad up and down. Left and right will change the screen brightness. Home and start will return to the main menu and, you know, like the shoulder buttons or something, um, they will save and load save states in emulation software. This is really good. And yes, this will also work in Pico 8. Well, okay, the save states won't work in Pico 8, obviously, but you can change the volume and everything in Pico 8 as well. Uh, it seems a bit contrived, but in practice I got hang of it very quickly, and now that I'm used to it, I kind of miss it with other devices. I just wish they printed the shortcuts directly on the case, like they did with the game shell. It would have made the initial experience so much smoother. Speaking of Pico 8, let's finally get into that. Because yes, this will run Pico 8 it will even run it natively, so there is no emulation happening. This is the actual Pico 8 that you download from the website. It's the real thing. Something I really liked is how easy it is to get Pico 8 running on this thing. You basically just drag and drop the files into a folder and it actually works. Crazy, huh? But you know what? We're starting to get into the weeds of emulation hardware here, so let me introduce you to an expert on this subject in case you want to know more details. Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Now my channel is relatively new in the retroverse, but I primarily focus on retro handheld gaming devices. The goal of my channel is to help you figure out how to play some of your old favorite games on various retro handheld devices or related platforms. And I'm new to all this myself, and so because of that I take a very beginner's approach to everything. And at some point in my research I stumbled upon Pico 8, and I immediately fell in love. I just love the idea of accessing Splore on a retro handheld device and having access to thousands of games at your fingertips. To me, Pico 8 is the community that we never really had when we were playing all these retro games. It's like a shared cinematic universe where we're all basically in it together, playing these wonderful micro games that were inspired by the games that we played in the past. And so I recently teamed up with Christian here at Lazy Devs to create a video guide where I show you how to get Pico 8 running on various retro handheld devices. And many of these devices run different operating systems, and I cover most of those as well. And to back that all up, I have a website with a full-on written guide, which you can then access and browse at your leisure. Either way, you got plenty of options here to get Pico 8 running on any number of retro handheld devices. So if you want to get Pico 8 running on your device, or you're not quite sure which retro handheld device is the best fit for you, I'll see you over at my channel. Thanks to Christian for letting me pop into your video, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming. Thanks, Russ. So yeah, this is what Pico 8 will look like when it's all ready to go. Your cards will show up here, but you can also launch directly into Splore and do everything from there. You can download new cards on the device directly from within Splore and just have a grand old time. How does Pico 8 look on the screen? It looks great. So okay, mm, this is a topic. So I don't want to get hung up in the technicalities here, but you know this has been an issue since the game shell and I've been very sensitive about this and I've been doing a lot of research. Uh, here is the gist. The Game Force has a 640 x 480 screen. 
And this is maybe the ideal resolution for a device like this. A lot of the consoles will run with crisp integer scaling with minimal borders. However, on paper, this resolution doesn't seem ideal for Pico 8. The screen is 480 pixels high. Pico 8 produces an image that is 128 pixels high. So the closest integer scale is three times, three X, and that would leave a huge black border. <clears throat> um, so now that I'm editing and I made this graphic, uh, you know what? The borders don't look that bad. So actually this might be a good alternative. Anyway. So in order to get like full screen, to take advantage of the full screen, you need to scale by an uneven number. And typically that's a bad thing. This can cause a lot of problems with image. In the case of the game shell, it causes like uneven pixels. Now, sometimes it also can cause a blurry image, it depends on the filtering that is happening. Well, I'm glad to report that it actually looks fantastic. No problem at all. Uh, I'm not sure if this is something that has to do with the firmware of the Game Force or if this is something that was introduced to Pico 8. I remember reading up something in one of the updates recently. But what's happening here is a so-called prescaler. Basically, the image of the Pico 8 is scaled up to a larger size than the screen with like huge chunky pixels, right? And then that image is then scaled back down to the size of the screen. So you get a nice full screen image with perfect, crisp, chunky, evenly sized pixels. Mwah, chef's kiss. I sorry if I sound like a broken record. I talked about this before, but I love playing Pico 8 games like this. It's all I want to do with this device. They are so nice and cute. It's all right here in Explore. I don't need to download any ROMs or anything. And it also made me rediscover all those games that I never played or played only very briefly. In the evenings, I really love to just plop down on the couch and just go Pico surfing for a while before going to bed. Guys, it's so good. We need to play more Pico 8 games, like actually play them. And I think this is an ideal way to do it. The Game Force is really nice and convenient to use every day. In my test, the battery lasted around six hours, over six hours of non-stop Pico 8 usage. Clicking the power button will put the device to sleep and it's like a real sleep mode. It's fast and reliable and it won't drain the battery. Like you can keep the device in sleep mode overnight and it's fine, no problem. Getting your ROMs and cards onto the device is also nice and easy. As I said, you know, for Pico 8 you can use the Explorer directly, but you can also just, you know, take out the SD card, pop it into your PC, and, you know, there's those MULX scripts that I talked about. They create a partition on the SD card that is actually readable on Windows PCs and Macs. I know this sounds like an obvious functionality, but you'll be surprised how many systems don't have this. So anyway, the partition will actually already have all the folders for the different systems set up. So you can just drag and drop all your data into it. And yes, if you're a huge big nerd, you can also FTP into the device as well. You can do that over Wi-Fi. So somebody will probably ask, so just to be clear, this is not a device to develop Pico games on. You could probably pull it off somehow. Like, mm, so it apparently has Bluetooth, but it doesn't have the Bluetooth drivers installed. So you have to do some hacking to get the Bluetooth running. It has also a single USB port, USB 3, so if you can get a keyboard going on this in a mouse with some kind of dongle or something, you might get it to work. It's not really a rabbit hole that I am that interested in exploring. It's To me, this is a dedicated gaming device. If you want to develop on something that is portable, what you want is the pocket chip. Yes! So back to the Game Force. The processor, it's rocking. The processor that's inside, that's called an RK3326, which probably doesn't mean anything to the most of you, but just so you know, at this point, it's a chip that's kind of like past its prime in the retro emulation community. Um, what else will it run? Well, basically all of the systems in the 8-bit and 16-bit era, as I said. So, you know, all of your Game Boys, Game Boy Advance, NES, Super NES, Mega Drive, and, you know, all these kind of things, they will work just fine. It will also run PlayStation 1 pretty nicely. From then on, we kind of get into the weeds. N64 is hit and miss, depends on the game. Dreamcast is hit and miss, depends on the game. Anything above that is mostly hard pass. I wouldn't expect anything. As I said, you won't be using those analog sticks too much anyway. But while the emulation community is already looking forward to the next chipset, I think for us in a fantasy console space, the RK3326 is a blessing. As I said, the Game Force is not the only handheld of its type. There are already many other devices rocking the same chip. And that means 
that all these other devices will also run similar firmware and that means they will also run Pico 8. So how does the Game Force compare with the alternatives? Well, one of the most popular Chinese companies making these devices is called Ambernic. Their newest series are the RG351 devices. I have to admit, they tend to look a bit nicer. I did buy the RG351P to compare and yes, it's nice and sleek. It doesn't have Wi-Fi, so there is no explore downloading unless you are willing to put up with some Wi-Fi dongles or in my case, a soldering iron. But also the screen is a lower resolution and that is a big deal. The image still looks fine. It's fine um, because it still uses the same pre-processing trick, but it just has less pixels to work with. So it's, there's just a bit more blurriness happening. It's just so much sharper on the Game Force. And I, now that I've seen the difference, I just can't go back anymore. The RG351M is basically the same device with Wi-Fi built in and a metal case. Uh, so if you like that form factor, and yeah, it's a nice and compact device, I would pick this one just for the Wi-Fi. The newest model from the line is the RG351V, and it has basically the same specs as the Game Force, which includes the sharper screen. It's probably its most direct competitor. But as you can tell, you know, that's a different format. That's a vertical device that's reminiscent of the original Game Boy. That's not bad. It's just a different device. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the single analog stick there in the corner. I don't know what that's supposed to do. I do like the wooden look though. I think this is hilarious. It's worth noting that the Embernic devices don't run the official MULX software. There are a couple of choices actually for them. Uh, the one I tried is uh, called 351 ELEC and it's kind of like a custom offshoot of MULEC. And it's very similar, but it's just like, you know, it's just little things. Like you can't quit out of Pico 8 by just pushing a button combination. You have to actually shut it down from within Pico 8 menu. And it's not a deal breaker, but come on guys, seriously? Another series that may be of interest is the Pow Kitty RGB 10 and especially the Pow Kitty RGB 10 Max. The regular RGB 10 has a smaller screen and no Wi-Fi, so it's basically like the Embernic 351P that I got. But the RGB 10 Max has Wi-Fi and it has an even bigger screen. It actually looks a little bit like a small Nintendo Switch, so you'd think that would result in a larger, sharper image, right? But actually it's just wider, so it's still just 480 pixels high like the Game Force. So with Pico 8 you just get a whole lot of unused screen space on the sides and this will cost at least 30 bucks more. So it really depends on what you are using this device for beyond Pico 8. But to be fair, I haven't used the RGB 10 Max myself, so I can't really tell. And in fact, there's also the Audroid Go Super and I can't say anything about that one either, but I've heard it had some issues with the buttons. Look, I'm just not a dedicated hardware channel and I'm reaching my limits here. That's why I think you should visit channels like Retro Game Corps if you want to know all the details and alternatives. The bottom line is that the Game Force does have a few competing handhelds, but at the time I'm doing this review, this one ends up being a pretty good entry. It has the specs right where it counts. It has the big screen, it has the nice buttons, it has Wi-Fi, and it has the good firmware. Oh, by the way, while we're discussing hardware, I also wanted to mention that you can get MULEC to run on a whole bunch of TV emulation boxes, which also means you can run Pico 8 on those too. So like a good one to check out would be the Super Console X, but maybe that's a topic for a whole different video. Okay, there's one last thing I want to discuss about the Game Force. So I said there are a lot of competing devices that are kind of like in the same ballpark, but there's one thing that sets the Game Force apart. It's the LED lightning. No, <laughs> I'm, actually, <laughs> I'm actually meant the distribution. So yes, all of these devices are made in China, which means getting them in the West can be tricky, right? So you have to order them from China through websites like AliExpress, or sometimes there will be some Chinese sellers on eBay or Amazon. And ordering those devices from China can feel super sketchy. At least that's how it felt to me when I was still in Germany. You're never really sure if you're ordering the right thing or if you maybe, you know, if you're maybe falling for some kind of scam. Sometimes you will find like Western shops that resell those devices, but they will usually charge a hefty surcharge. So the unique thing about the Game Force is actually that it's sold exclusively on the website directly by the people making it. 
The website is all in English, they ship worldwide, it's 95 bucks for the device and then they will charge you like additional 15 bucks to ship it to most Western countries. Maybe it's subjective, but to me this feels so much more safer than some random Chinese mass retailer on eBay. You just know that the people you're interacting with are actually the people who make these things. And I know this sounds silly, but I know to some of you out there, this will actually make the difference between the Game Force and those other handhelds. So yeah, this is it. This is the Game Force. It's good. I like it a lot. Plays Pico 8 like a champ. How much do I like it? Well, here's how much. Before I got my hands, just based on the looks and the specs, I would have not bought it with my own money. It just looks too janky. I would have bought an Embernic device for sure. But now, after using it for a while, if I somehow lost this one, well, to be honest, in this case, I still have the green one. But if I lost the green one too, I would immediately put down the 100 bucks to replace it. For sure. No question about it. It has gotten somehow its hooks into me. The Game Force gets my stamp of approval. But the bottom line I want to leave you here with is a bit different. So it's not about the Game Force, actually. I want to focus on something else. The time has come, guys. The dream is real. I'm here to tell you. You can turn this fantasy into reality now. It's crazy because even a year ago, all those devices didn't exist. But now they're here and it's really easy and it's fairly affordable. One of those bad boys will be the right one for you. And if it's not the Game Force, maybe it's going to be the RG351V or the RGB10 Max. Who knows? Check out Retro Gaming Corps, get informed, get on board, and most importantly, play more Pico 8 games. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye.